listening to Stories from Real Life, a podcast by engaging storytellers for engaged story listeners. Here's your host, author and journalist, Melvin E. Edwards. Hello, and welcome to this July 16th edition of Stories from Real Life. I'm your host, Melvin E. Edwards. John Williams will tell us more about Sarah Bird, who is today's special guest. Our guest today is a best-selling author of more than a dozen novels and essay collections. Acclaimed writer Sarah Bird is an NPR moth storyteller, a winner of the Meryl Streep Screenwriting Competition, a member of the Texas Literary Hall of Fame, a finalist for the Dublin International Literary Award, and the hologram greeter for the Austin Central Library near the University of Texas campus. Her latest book honors the black cowboy because a quarter of all early Texas ranch hands and bronco busters were enslaved or direct descendants of enslaved Americans. Host Melvin E. Edwards is himself a direct descendant of several of those cowboys. And because of that, he is one of the rare black members of the Sons of the Republic of Texas. Today's episode is part literacy and part acknowledgement of a forgotten past. Saddle up. And join Melvin E. Edwards and his fascinating conversation with award winning author Sarah Bird. Thank you, John. Sarah Bird, welcome to the show. Well, I am delighted to be here. Well, Thank I'm delighted to have you. I, I'm excited to talk to you about the about your new book and a lot of other things that you've done in your life. But first, let's start off with um, talking about your hologram image that's being used <laughs> as a greeter at the Austin Public Library. That, I think that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> the question is... Yeah, go ahead. Is, is this a hologram? <laughs> I, I think it could be. We'll, we'll find yeah, out soon can, enough. Yeah, it, yeah, AI yeah. can do all kinds of wizard, wizardry. So, so uh, does it feel... When you go to the library, you see yourself there as a greeter. <laughs> it, you know, it, it was. Uh, it just reminds me of, of the experience of, of um, when they recorded it, and so they did. They do it in Spanish and English. So for one day, I was able to say that chunk in Spanish. Bienvenido a Biblioteca Central de Ostente. <laughs> so that okay, got that. <laughs> so did you actually say it, or did they? Overdone. No, 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 no. I, I actually said it. And, you know, I could not make any mistakes. And they had to start the whole thing again. And if anybody actually looks at that, a butterfly truly flies up through the screen. So uh, there's a butterfly flying up and it you know, goes past the book. So that was extremely cool. Wow. Yeah. It's like it was all planned. That, I hope that I the butterfly gets some I acting know. credits. I, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Credit that butterfly. <laughs> All right. So I was thinking about, as in, in, pre- in preparing for this, thinking about that hologram. And that seems like a metaphor in a lot of ways for the long history of black cowboys. Um, oh, it, seemed to, that's- it seemed to exist only sort of in a pixelated form and never quite fleshed out. So was humanizing those people to your objective with this June Juneteenth rodeo book that you just published? Uh so my objective, you know, I started taking these, I started taking rodeo photos uh, in the late, in the mid seventies. Uh, and I started off doing what I considered the renegade rodeos, non-mainstream rodeos. And I photographed uh, kids, old timers, uh, chariadas, not necessarily rodeos, but um, Native American rodeos, police, prison rodeos. It's just not, not the usual. I was a newcomer to Texas and and this fascinated me. Mostly I was fascinated by the worlds that sprang up around the rodeos. And um, I did not hear about black rodeos. I did not learn about them until, um, you know, pretty late in the game. And I heard about them from a livestock uh, contractor that I met in Clovis, New Mexico, and he was going to provide the stock for rodeo at the legendary Diamond L Arena, which used to be located on far south Main outside of Houston. It was a legendary venue for cowboys and cowgirls of color. So that was that was just a glorious introduction for me to black rodeos. And from the moment I set foot in that rodeo, I knew that that they were different and to me better more interesting, certainly more vibrant, alive, vivid, 
and uh, so that's then that's what I dedicated myself to. And what what astonished me was then bringing the photos back to Austin. I was in photojournalism at that time, and would show them to friends and. And I was just amazed to hear people say, I didn't know they were black cowboys. And they didn't, they didn't say it in a mean way, just, it just was, you know, not part of their, of, of their whole gestalt of what a cowboy was. And so they kind of said it like puzzled, like, I didn't know they were Italian leprechauns. It just didn't fit the mold for them that Hollywood had created. So you, Hollywood almost didn't allow us to see these, <laughs> black cowboys, which, you know, very common in Texas. So that was the moment. And it was more about just telling an untold story and and capturing the unseen images. And that's what really motivated me. I just I just knew it was a great story. And, and apparently nobody had heard it. Wow. That's or at least I mean, let me take that back. Nobody outside of that community, obviously, right. obviously these events were very well known and celebrated within the community, but not so much outside. Well, yeah, Holograms. we'll be talking about that throughout the throughout this conversation. So again, your new coffee table um, book is called Juneteenth Rodeo, and you called it a quote Valentine to the Black Rodeo Circuit of the 1970s. What do you mean? By yeah, that? Uh, I mean I. Um, you know, I was really dedicated to publishing this book in the late 70s, early 80s. And so I, uh, and just to take your listeners back to that time and remind them, this was a time of film photography, what is now called analog. Uh, it was expensive and it was a pretty laborious process. And I was a pretty poverty stricken, just out of school kind of freelancer with way too much emphasis on the free. <laughs> Not enough of the other stuff going on. So, um, no, it was a real effort to to get these printed and submit them to to publishers. And I was certain that they would be as, as electrified as I was by these images. And instead, what I heard back was, uh, you know, great photos, but we don't think there's a quote unquote market. We don't think there's an audience for this book. And I, I did a presentation recently with the um, great black historian Michael Hurd, and and he he said it kind of illuminated me. He said, "Oh, Sarah, that was code for we don't think black folks read," which was kind of shocking. And I, you know, obviously not true then, wildly not true now. So, you know, it broke my heart, it broke my bank account, but I stored these photos, my negatives and prints away um, for decades, decades and decades. And, you know, maybe you know, they might have <laughs> they might have stayed there for forever had it not been for the pandemic. And then, like so many of us at that time, you know, I had nothing to do but clean up my house. So I dug out. They got these photos, and the instant I looked at them, the instant I looked at them, I, I, I said, you have got to bring these to the attention of a wider world. This was slightly before the explosion of interest in, in black cowboys and reclaiming the heritage of blacks in the West. Um, but, um, you know, that that is definitely very, very much in, in the national attention now. Yeah, and that actually leads right into my next question. Um, Beyonce brought about a new conversation surrounding black roots and country music, but the cowboy yes. part of our nation's heritage has been around for generations, at least here oh, in Texas, it certainly has. So what, what generated, other than just being introduced by that single person, what generated this depth of an interest for you in black cowboys? Um, like I said, it was just, it's just from the moment I said foot, you know, first of all, it was just just such a vivid contrast to other rodeos and I, I you know first of all you know it's a multi-sensory experience you step foot in a black rodeo and the first thing you always smell was barbecue you know and I, I have some wonderful pictures of Burnell Jammer pitmaster extraordinaire at many of the rodeos I attended and then um, and then you could hear it 
you know, instead of some mournful country and western ballad, well, he stopped loving her today, something like that. I mean, the first song I heard was Boogie Fever. And I said, <laughs> how can you do this? And then, and then just see, and then I walked, uh, you know, I was like circling the arena and, and one of the shoot men was getting a, a rider ready and he was wearing a shirt with a Jackson 5 on the back. I said, oh, this does not happen at other rodeos. It should, but it doesn't. So uh, I fell in love. I just fell in love. And, and the other part of this equation was how kind everybody was to me, how welcoming, how incredibly hospitable. And this, Melvin, I have to tell you, would have been in direct contrast to how unwelcome any of those competitors or fans would have been made to feel at a white rodeo at that time. It's throughout the South. I, uh, as I said, I photographed uh, a lot of prison rodeos and in an article, uh, Ebony Magazine, around that time, they said that these were the only, in the South, the only desegregated rodeos were the prison rodeos, which is wow. its own tragedy. Wow. Yeah. So can, yeah. can you explain what the, or describe what the soul circuit is? Um, the Soul Circuit essentially turned out to be, I didn't know it at the time, was uh, was where I was photographing. And this was essentially 150 mile, within a 150 mile radius of Houston. And these were a lot of um, communities that had sprung up in, you know, after emancipation in where the great Texas cotton, sugar and um, rice plantations had been. So these are a lot of them were in settlements from formerly enslaved people, small, very small rural outposts like Egypt, El Campo, Pin Oak. I've lost track of all the dinky little places I went to and photographed. But so these were the other important thing about the, the rodeos I photographed is they kind of I was there kind of at a pivotal moment before this big demographic shift from rural to urban. So at this point, most of the competitors I photographed uh, rode, the ropers would ride horses that they had broken and trained themselves. And the riders, the rough stock riders probably learned, you know, they didn't learn on mechanical bulls. They probably learned on stock at their own uh, ranch or farm. So, you know, that, that's different now. And the big, the big rodeo circuit in today's world is the uh, Bill Pickett Invitational Rodeo Circuit. And that is a professional rodeo circuit. You know, the competitors are obviously invited and it takes place in big arenas in and um, coliseums, mostly in, in large cities. So it's not, you know, what I photographed, it was a real expression of the community where, where these events were held. Well, this topic is one that's that's very close to my heart and close to my family. I've written two books about my family's history in Texas, going back to the Republic of Texas days. And I, I, I spoke to you that. a little bit about this um, in, in the emails that we've exchanged. And because of that, I'm, I'm one of the few black members of the Sons of the Republic of Texas. And I was told at the time I was um, accepted for membership that I was only the third or fourth black member. Um, that was in 2021. And so there have wow. been several there have been several since then. And, and part of the reason, well, the entire reason certainly wasn't because there were no black people during the Republic of Texas, because roughly like just like the number of cowboys, which is about one fourth of all cowboys, probably one fourth of all Texans at the time were black. But there's not the paper trail and you have to be able to prove mm -hmm. your family was here at that time. And because I had done 30 years of research and it got lucky with this one document, I was able to document that my family had been here since at least 1844. That's fantastic. So I'm a proud descendant of cowboys on my mom's side and farmers on my dad's side. Mm -hmm. And so my, one of my cousins was just inducted into the Black Cowboy Hall of Fame just oh, really? a couple of weeks ago. Who's that? His name is O.B. Jackson. 
So I don't know if that name means anything to you yet. But where where uh, where was he competing or active? I, I don't know. Uh, well, he's from Houston. He he grew up okay. in Houston. Yep. His his children were my age. I actually was a classmate of one of his sons, and we didn't even know we were cousins until we went to a family reunion. And I know his my mom had always talked about OB, and I didn't know who OB was. And I went and met him, found out it was my classmate's dad, who was also my cousin. That's but, fantastic. Uh, so at, at some point, I'm sure you probably run across some member or multiple members of my family at some of those. Oh, gosh, you know, Melvin, I really wonder about that. It was so important to me <clears throat> that I identify as many of my subjects, the fans and competitors as I could during the process of once UT Press accepted the book for publication. Uh, and fortunately, I preserved all the photographs, but the notes I had taken at that time were long gone or disintegrated. Um, I had some, I had a few, you know, certainly I, I knew the important people that I'd made friends with. But so I started posting these photographs on social media. And I didn't have, you know, extremely high hopes that anybody would get in touch with me because, you know, the people I photographed were my age, older people and primarily rural people. But to my great surprise and delight, I started being contacted by people who said, that's my dad, that's my uncle, that's my aunt. And it was such a, it was such a thrilling experience to be able to track down as many of the identities as I could and to give credit to everybody who created this wonderful, joyous world. And that process is still ongoing because the Humanities of Texas funded a traveling exhibition. And I have in the opening panel, I have my email address and inviting anybody, you know, if they recognize anyone in the photos who has not been identified to get in touch with me. And, you know, and I'd say the same thing for anybody who reads who reads the book and, and, and recognizes someone, please get in touch with me. Well, I have so many memories around these rodeos. Oh, do you? My, my dad used to take me around to the rodeos. Actually, my two of my mother's brothers were bull riders. And, and some of oh my gosh, who was, who was that? Um, Jack Jones and well, Junior Jones is what they call him. His name was Clifton Jones Junior, or Orlene Orlene Jones Junior, and Clinton and then Clifton Jones was the one who was who went by Jack. So hey, again, look through my, look through my books, see if you have any okay. relatives in there. Yeah, I was I was pretty young when I would go to those rodeos. I was always just enthralled by what I saw. But as I got older, I thought back at it and I thought, hmm, my uncles were probably in their 40s during wow. the time I saw them. And, and when you're 25, you're pretty old for a bull run. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is exactly right. And, uh, you know, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, this gentleman right here. I'm, I'm now showing a picture of the incredible the fabulous iconic uh bailey's prairie kit that's his rodeo name his real name is taylor hall jr hardly anybody calls him that they call him uh bailey or the kid but i uh, this is a photo of him at the diamond l riding a bronc and he has on his trademark impeccable white shirt a tie and a cigar <laughs> he always <laughs> rode with a cigar and um this was shortly before he retired. So this, I, he was in his late forties when I took this photo, which is dangerously geriatric for a rough stock rider. That is right? crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and then he came. He came to the exhibition held uh, uh, Juneteenth celebration at the Neil Cochran House Museum. And so that was that was such a thrill for me because I had tried to get in touch with him a number of times. I knew he was still alive. He's now ninety three years old. Wow! And he came. Some a friend of his had heard about the show and brought him. He still lives in Bailey's Prairie. And oh my gosh, ninety three years old. He looked better than me. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually know where Bailey's Prairie is. I'm sure I've been there to a rodeo time or two. <laughs> Yep, yep. But what's your favorite story from the book? Uh, 
from the book. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I have, as you call it, the crud, which everyone <laughs> has, and they know it lingers forever. Um, I would say I'm now looking at a, a photograph of a very good looking cowboy in a white shirt against the night sky, standing on the saddle of his horse and dancing. This was um, this is this is a very meaningful photograph to me because I I took it at about at a rodeo outside Bastrop, and it was one of the first rodeos that um, George, who became my husband, came to with me. So I was busy photographing what was in front of me in the arena, and then I heard Barry White's "Can't Get Enough of Your Love" playing. <laughs> And a lot of hubbub going, and I turned around, and there was this magnificent cowboy dancing in the saddle. And I just love this photo. I love, I love everything it reminds me of, that beautiful night in Bastrop, and the joy, which you, uh, there's, a, there's a fan looking up at him, and you can just see the joy in his face. And it's just, it's just the coolest photograph. It's just the coolest and the coolest memory, so... That probably, I mean, is meaningful for me for a number of reasons. Right. Also, the photograph I wanted for the cover of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you were going to say when you talked about the Barry White song, I thought you were going to say you turned and Barry White was there. <laughs> he, he actually is. A, he was actually a Texan. He, he was born in Galveston, Texas. I don't know if you knew that. Did not know that. Did uh-huh. not know that. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> or or horse if it was Barry getting up there. <laughs> <laughs> I know Barry is a big guy. <laughs> sturdy sturdy horses in Texas. Yeah. All right, so yeah. you, you've written nearly a dozen novels, and this book is Correct. very different from what you normally do. Was was this a right. passion project for you? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. As as uh, I mean, certainly there's. No money involved, as there as there isn't in most photo books. Uh, but you know, it's so much more rewarding on so many other levels for me. It's this, you know, it's a dream I had almost fifty years ago, and just thank God I'm still alive to see it fulfilled. And 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 more important than that, to to have it released into a country where where black cowboys, black cowgirls, and black heritage in the West is finally being honored and and recognized. Your timing couldn't be any better. I, I know it took forever to get to that point, but the, your timing was good. I'm I sure know, you would have rather have, have had it 45 years ago. You know, yeah, that, Melvin, that is that is poignant for me to look. And I don't know how much, you know, my little book would have enlightened anybody. Or, you know, I think maybe people have to wait for the time to be enlightened and, and to see what's right in front of them. Uh but you know, I I regret the long decades of invisibility. I I regret that. I I I regret the you know the disjunction that people had between you know seeing a, a black person in in cowboy regalia and, and how it just now started to fit. So, what was your reaction? How did you feel the first time the first copy you saw? Oh, oh I just I just got goosebumps. I just got goosebumps. I mean, it's surreal. It's a surreal experience to um, have this dream that you had fifty years ago finally come to fruition. And I, um, you know, I'm I just kind of look back and I'm just kind of proud of the person that took these photographs. But I don't I don't feel, obviously I don't feel like that person anymore. Um, you know, I. If it had gotten published, I might have become a photographer, but obviously, you know, instead I went down the writing path, which is um, very different, very, very much more introverted sort of life. So, um, you know, on a, on a personal level, it's just many, many emotions. So when, when you run across people who either you're, you're just having a conversation with or who you're, you're discussing your book with and they say they didn't know they were black cowboys, what what do you say to them? <laughs> it's just stunning. I mean, that still happens. And, you know, people say kind of apologetically that they just didn't know. They just literally didn't know. And But, you know, you think of all, all you know, decades and decades that Hollywood and popular culture spent 
um, reinforcing this image, this John Wayne image that the uh, job qualifications for being a cowboy were wear big hat, wear big boots, have white skin. And so it's just, you know, inability to see what is clearly right in front of your eyes. I think it's fascinating. And not to go too deep into this, but it does have a lot to do with, um, as I as I told you earlier, I grew up in the military world or uh, Catholic. Yeah. So either I went to Catholic schools or military schools, and you learn a pretty valid version of American history, which was kind of a shock to me when I came to Texas, and that appeared not to be the version that people had been taught. So there, you know, there was that piece of, to explain this puzzle was, um, yeah, kind of if you have these confused ideas about what caused the Civil War, that would lead to a lot of misconceptions and, uh, you know, and a kind of skewed view of reality. So that's, I mean, I attribute it to that. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't fault people for not knowing what they hadn't been taught. Right. You don't know until you know. And if you don't know until you know. You, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Beyonce. You. <laughs> <laughs> She's been done a I lot, done a do. lot. <laughs> yeah, so um, you've been a longtime columnist for Texas Monthly Magazine. Uh-huh. And when you came, you came to Texas because of your then boyfriend. Uh, could you have oh ever God, the true story? I, yes, I, I've I've done I've done my research. <laughs> could my you have ever predicted that you would not only stay here in Texas but become something of a Molly Ivins cultural figure? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, high praise. It. No, not in a million years. I um, um, no, I had I had fully intended to go back to New Mexico, where where most of my family is. And, but then I married a Texan, gave birth to a Texan. All my friends are Texan. I fell in love with Texas, you know, certain versions of Texas. <laughs> um, but I will say, I, I think it's that, you know, you mentioned that it's been a big advantage being an outsider because you see things that if you grow up with it, you know, you, you don't see, you take for granted. And I think all the oddities of the of the state really jumped out at me, which is why I love photojournalism because it gave me permission to photograph all these pretty wacky things like rattlesnake roundups and sorority rushes and <laughs> honky tonk dance halls. Roundup. <laughs> <laughs> I was going, who are these crazy people? <laughs> really? And the other part of it is that Texas just thinks it's the center of the universe. <laughs> well, what do you mean, thinks? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I know that you're a, you're a the member of the Republic. What, not I. Yes, I stand corrected. In fact, that's the center of the universe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but it was great growing up in the military, you know, so I moved a lot. And, and you know, you, you, you understand quickly, every place thinks it's the center of the universe. <laughs> And it is to the people there, and it, and it makes Precisely, sense. Precisely, of think. course. You're living your life there, and that's your center, as right. it should be. Right. So your book was just recently released, uh, just before Juneteenth. I'm wondering, um, I'm sure you're already collecting stories from reactions. What What's the most interesting oh response you've gotten so far? Oh, my gosh. I have just been overwhelmed. Uh, um you know, I, I did a presentation in Belton, and I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. But a gentleman there said he recognized my dancing cowboy, and he promised that he would send me invitation, I mean, information about that. Um, and I certainly wish he would. Uh, but I've just really been been stunned at how widespread black rodeo culture is and how many people have such like i do incredibly fond recollections of the kind of rodeos that i went to and how meaningful they had been in so many people's lives um and then of course you know the high point was when bailey's prairie kid came to austin and i got to shake the gentleman's hand and so that you know i could never have predicted that but an incredible thrill. Didn't did he remember you? No, 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 absolutely not. I um, no, we didn't. 
<laughs> to my recollection, we did not speak, but I am so grateful that I that I took the pictures I did at the very end of his of his uh, rough stock writing career and. I'm, I'm keep looking at the picture because that's you know this he's on this this black horse and it's just so it's a night shot and he's so beautiful he's just has perfect form he's as they say marking out his 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 mount you know has his stirrups up ahead in front of the uh, you know exactly where they should be so the judges will give him will score him and one hand free as they as they always told rough stock riders reaching reaching for a handful of sky and there he is so uh, no i but i certainly remember him <laughs> he doesn't <Obviously>. remember that. <laughs> so, so, so your book is isn't just about isn't just celebrating the black cowboys it's obviously in, in honor of juneteenth as well so with, with right. Juneteenth yeah. a national holiday now, has that generated any additional interest in these types of topics? Um, I think so. I think so. Just just that level of heightened awareness. Um, you know, so obviously I was, you know, I was aware of Juneteenth since the 1970s when it's going to the rodeos and, and you know, all the, you know, most wonderful, fun, festive rodeos they always were but the the most fun and most festive were the juneteenth rodeos so i i had that awareness and and then you know then it disappeared it disappeared for many years certainly from my life and uh, a certain mention of it but it's uh, you know a national holiday now as it should be have you gotten any negative response no, no, I'm very, uh, you know, as a white woman, I expected to, to get some pushback about that. But I, you know, the overwhelming reaction has been gratitude, which I think is, is appropriate because it's essentially a lost archive that I have, that I've returned to the community, to the, to the people that created this world. And, you know, now that more evidence that it was always there. As you as you mentioned, there's a pretty fair amount of awareness that one fourth of all the hands on the great cattle drives of the late 1800s were black and and worked the huge cattle ranches before during before and during the Civil War. So there's there's a fair amount of awareness about that, and you know now there is an explosion of interest and and in in reclaiming black history in the West. But between then and now, as I say, there are these decades of invisibility, and I'm, I'm so pleased that I took these photographs to help fill that void. Well, I'm, I'm thankful, too, and I'm, I'm really pleased with the quality of the book and, and happy to share it with, with friends and, and family. So I'm looking forward to having you sign it. So. Uh, oh, I can't what, wait. I can't wait. So what, what type of book tour or uh, promotional efforts are you doing surrounding this book? Uh, you know, that's sort of taken care of itself. And I will say university presses don't necessarily, they don't necessarily do. And actually very few publishers do book tours anymore. But um, but there's been stories in the Houston Chronicle. There have been stories in, there's a story in the Dallas Morning News and the San Antonio paper did something. And I've been on a number of NPR uh, affiliates throughout the state. So, you know, I feel like I've done my part. <laughs> I think, I think it's, I think that's, and I'm talking to Melvin E. Edwards on his podcast. <laughs> what more can I'm, anyone ask for? That's probably the, the high point of your life here. Is all this down. is pretty much, this is pretty much <laughs> it, what we're sharing right now. Yeah. All that went before was, as of not as a preparation for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you are a lot of fun to talk to. Let me just. Say. I appreciate that. Thank you. So I just have one last question for you, and this one is way out of left field. Cool. Un unrelated to what we've been discussing so far. How did you become a go-go dancer in Tokyo? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! You're. <laughs> You are. All my secrets are out. 
I did not come to to university to Texas to go to graduate school. I followed a bad boyfriend. That <laughs> yes, how did I become a go go dancer? So as I say, you know, uh, my family was stationed in Okinawa, Kadena Air Base, and um, I was visiting them. At that point, I was um, I'd started college, so I was of college age, uh, and there just wasn't a lot to do in in Okinawa, but. I, I heard on the radio they announced a dance contest and the winner would uh, would get a free trip to Tokyo, all expense paid. My family had been stationed in in Japan and I really, really wanted to go back and, and visit. And so I, uh, <laughs> I entered this dance contest and I think by virtue of me being uh, – of legal age and there weren't very many there weren't very many over 18 um girls there so uh yeah that that uh i became a a go-go dancer so i did i did two weeks as a go-go dancer i was uh i toured with the third rate comedian i was maybe a fifth rate go-go dancer (laughs) but it was it was something so different from anything in my life. And uh, I originally set out to write a novel about it called Yakota Officers Club. And it ended up being instead about something I care a lot more about than my two weeks in show business, which is my family. So, um, hey, oh, Bobby Monahan, the third rate comedian who, who <laughs> picked me to tour with him. <laughs> Isn't that a bizarre experience? <laughs> that yes, yeah, so I'll bet you did not expect that question, but I told you I did my research. <laughs> you do do your research. I kind of, I kind of had stopped talking about that some time ago. <laughs> so writers this talk about their Guggen- Go ahead. Some writers talk about their Guggenheims and their Pulitzers. Like, hey, I was a go-go dancer. <laughs> You'd be surprised that I've only been doing this podcast for a year, and and I, I have I have a guest per week, and people that's that's why I wanted to do this. It's a storytelling podcast for everyday people who have done some unusual things or some inspiring things, and you'd be surprised. You just start you ask people questions. And people all the time ask me, "How do I get my guests?" And I just reach out to them. People love to talk about themselves generally. So I just ask them questions and let them talk. And, uh, and I do some research. <laughs> Beautiful format. Well, you know, as far as inspiration, I hope my story does inspire some of your listeners who might have uh, long projects that they've held on to and not come to fruition. And, you know, that's I want to inspire them by um by my overnight publishing success. And obviously the key to that was just stay alive, stay alive. You don't know. <laughs> the world might not have been ready for your project before, and maybe it is now. So you needed to take the photos, hold on to them for 50 years, stay yeah, alive, that. have a worldwide pandemic so that you'd have to clean your house <laughs> and then and then find the publisher. <laughs> you know, Melvin, that's a lot of dominoes now that you start naming them. A lot of dominoes had to fall. A lot, just a the lot way you dominoes. planned it. Just the way just, you planned yes, it. Just, yes, yes. Falling in, falling into my diabolical scheme. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my guest this week has been Hall of Fame writer and hologram, Sarah Bird. I don't know if she's a hologram now or not, but either way, she's, she's a great she guest. She is. So Sarah, thank you for being here and sharing your stories. It's thank been a pleasure. You, Mel, this you. was a blast. You're a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. So that's it for this week's episode of Stories from Real Life. Join us again next time for another great storytelling journey. Until then, don't forget to shine your light wherever you go. That was Stories from Real Life. Join us again next week for another great storytelling journey. See you next time.